welcome to Right Now Workshop Podcast, where you can write a book and change the world. I'm your host, Kitty Buholtz, and this is episode 280, Writers in the Gig Economy, an interview with Lynn Bohart, coming to you on Thursday, December 23rd, 2021. Merry Christmas and happy holidays, my friends. If you are not watching on YouTube, I've got my Santa hat on. I've got my Winnie the Pooh stocking that is currently empty because it's the 23rd and Santa hasn't arrived yet. So we'll see whether or not any yummy, delicious things get put in here. I hope that you are having a fantastic week. I hope that you're taking a little bit of time off, getting some rest. Remember that having fun and getting rest will help your writing. So please consider doing a little bit of it. Please consider doing a little bit more than a little of it. I'm planning on taking a lot. Uh, my, my current plan is taking two weeks off, relaxing, doing actual fun things, which I know this sounds weird. I'm actually going to have to put on my calendar after the holidays. Uh, so I remember I have to take moments of having fun because it's good for my mental health and it's good for like my writing. And, um, and also I'm going to read some books that I have seen, but haven't read yet about what play does to your brain and how it helps your brain. So lots of reasons to have a little bit of play time. And I really do believe, I know that it's true for me. I believe it's probably true for all of us that these sorts of relaxation and regeneration and rest and refilling the creative well, I really think that um, for everyone, it makes our writing better when we come back to it, whether it's just for, we're away for a few hours and then we come back. Um, I've done that at writer's conferences, you know, take a little break and come back and I'm totally rejuvenated and ready to go for another couple of hours. And um, so I'm gonna go and say, I believe it'll be good for you too. <laughs> so, um, do those things, please. If you're listening to this and it's not the holidays, ask yourself if you are taking enough rest and time for yourself, in addition to taking time for your writing. Now, we are going to have a really interesting podcast episode about all the other things, not all of them, but quite a list of other things that you can do as a writer that are writing related activities that will um, bring in some income. So that is very cool. If you are in retirement or nearly in retirement, um, Lynn is also in retirement and has a lot of great ideas. And if you're not in retirement, even if you're like a young parent or something who feels like you need 27 more hours in the day just to get through, let alone get your writing done, there are some uh, interesting ideas that maybe you haven't considered. So let's go talk to Lynn. Today's guest is Lynn Bohart. Lynn holds a master's degree in stage direction and has taught both acting and directing, helping countless students bring their characters to life. Steeped in the three-act play structure, she went on to write and self-publish eight popular paranormal mystery novels on Amazon.com. The first book in her Old Maids of Mercer Island series, In Keeping with Murder, remained on Amazon's top 100 ghost story list for 10 months. She also teaches the craft of storytelling through Green River College and has written for both Patch.com and The Renton Reporter. Most recently, after retiring from a 35-year career as a nonprofit executive, she is the founder of Lil Dog Communications, a freelance writing and consulting company that now has her writing for nonprofits and individuals all over the world. Welcome, Lynn. Thank you very much, Kitty. It's so fun. You and I just got connected through a mutual friend. And then here we are talking about writing together. So, and, and so there's a funny story because so oh. we connected us that when I launched my freelance writing company, I started on Fiverr.com. Do you know what Fiverr is? It's a gig freelance uh, writing. Well, freelance everything. Um, <laughs> yeah. Videos and whatever. She was my, Sophie was my very first Fiverr client. Really? Yeah. And then, so I wrote something for her through Fiverr and then we started working offline and we worked together for about 10 months and oh, we wow. just became friends and then we reconnected recently and she connected me with you. How fun. She's the, the nicest person. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Oh, cool. Well, listen, so um, you have all sorts of interesting things going on in your life. Let's, um, let's figure out some way for you to give us a little background that kind of brings us into a, a sharper and sharper focus as we get talking more about writing. So you, you started, have you always worked in nonprofit? 
as a career, yes. Um, I, the weird thing is that I got my graduate degree in theater, specifically in directing, thinking that I would teach at the university level. And almost immediately when I started looking for jobs across the country, they wanted um, a PhD or they wanted a master's degree in five years professional theatrical experience. And I got my degree at San Diego State University and there is a professional, um, the old globe down there, but my advisors never told me to go down and work there. So I was immediately at a, at a standstill. I couldn't, couldn't do anything. And I, and I sort of fell into the nonprofit world. And oddly enough, I, I worked, had worked in a mental health situation for several years. I, one of my most interesting things I've done in my life is I ran a psychiatric ward and care for three years. Um, and uh, talk about drama. And, <laughs> uh, and then I ended up getting my first um, nonprofit fundraising job at the Mental Health Association. Wow. Um, so I was able to kind of combine some of my background and they hired me. And then I spent, I moved up to be the development director. And then I moved up to San Francisco from San Diego and kept moving north actually um and was the executive director for several different hospital foundations and the most recently here in the seattle area for a community foundation for 12 years before i retired so yeah interesting background and a lot of writing you do in the nonprofit world um and most nonprofit people don't have a background in writing oh. and so i honed some of my skills there grant writing and fundraising appeals and things like that. And that's, it was probably about 15 years ago, I started writing my novels and trying to get them traditionally published and not getting anywhere. And I, and um, when I was living in Vancouver, Washington, my brother said, Hey, Lynn, you ought to look into self-publishing. And so I started researching self-publishing and um, decided to go that route and have frankly just stayed that route um, because I, I have so much um, freedom and you know control over what I do uh, and I can market as much as I want or not at all or you know I mean so I know you're a self-published author too and and um, I don't know it just feels better to me yeah I I really enjoy um you know, yeah, I guess there's a little bit of OCD and um, I don't know, maybe a little perfectionism, but um, control issues. <laughs> I really like being able to be in charge of all the decisions. I mean, they're my books and I enjoy being able to make the decisions. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I pay for it with having to, to do all the work or yeah. find people to do the work. So, right. And I, I think for me, when I when I really started writing my books, I, um, I just fell in love with writing. And, and I have kind of a funny story because when I was in Oregon, the way I, I, I really got started was I took a ghostwriting class. It was a three-day weekend or two-day weekend uh, at, the, at the coast in Oregon. And uh, the woman who taught it was a published author, traditionally published author. And um, so Friday night, we all, we, we assembled in this boathouse, this old boathouse that overlooked this lake. And it's, it, it, did you see that that the camera just went out? Okay, I think we're okay. Anyway, um, and she told us what we were gonna be doing. And then all the next day we would be writing our story. And then Saturday night, we would sit around by candlelight and read the ghost stories. And she told me the next morning, she said, Lynn, the, I, I wrote something called The Boathouse, and it was because we were in a boathouse. And she said, that's good enough to be published. And I'm not kidding. <laughs> Kitty, I, I drove home thinking, oh, my God, I could write a novel. <laughs> I, mean, it was like, Seri I look back at that now and I think, seriously, she told you a short story was good enough to be published. And I went home and started writing my first novel. Um, but that's what kind of launched me. And, and so I worked full time. I was working 45, 50 hours a week in writing when I got home. And when I retired, I thought, which is about three years ago, I thought, well, I'll, I'll just write full time. And then I, I thought, well, that's, that's really isolating. I don't need to talk to a whole lot of other people when I'm writing my novels. And that's why I launched the freelance writing company, because 
it forces me to, to be connected you know, to other people and, and interacting with other people. And now I love that too. The difference is now that I'm writing all day long. So I, I write for not just nonprofits. I write fundraising letters and case statements and blog posts and things like that. A lot of, I write a lot of speeches for people. Um, somehow I got to be a go-to speech writer on Fiverr. Um, and then I noticed that I wasn't writing as much at night because right. I was writing all day yeah so the last novel um it was the third book in my Giorgio Salvatore mystery series which is a detective series took me three years to to publish because I was then building my freelance company so you know there's that trade-off that you have to find if you're if you're just writing all the time and and um and I found a better balance now so that this last, the book that, that I told you I'm, I'm just finishing up, I'll, I hope to have it out in January, uh, basically will have taken me just a little over a year, which is more typical for me. I, I don't know. I know a lot of, I've even, you know, bought books and sat in on webinars and stuff with people who write three or four books a year. Yeah. I, I don't, I can't do that. That's, that just seems like, churning them out to me um so I I take a little bit more time but um but god I love it yeah yeah I just totally get lost in my novels I'm I'm with you I in fact uh, there's so many things here that I'm like nodding my head going yep I totally get you um when my husband got the first uh job overseas we moved to Australia and so what's that globe trotting (laughs) yes which was really fun for a while and after a while I was like I am so over packing and unpacking (laughs) Mm -hmm. but um that first job uh we were pretty sure that I couldn't get a job there so therefore I had 24 hours a day to decide what I was going to do with my time and that was a great uh let's see how long it was a three-month job that ended up being 12 months and that was a fantastic time for my writing because there was literally nothing that I um could do or needed to do we even thought we were only going to be there at one more month one more month so it's not like I could plan anything um so that was a really good year for writing but like overall over the last uh 15 or 20 years whatever it's been now um there have been times when I'm like okay I have 100% of my time for writing but now I miss talking to people I miss helping people and teaching so mm-hmm. I had to find a way you know to balance that And then this last year and a half, I've been working with a a business coach uh, throughout the pandemic. It's not like people could go anywhere. I was literally 24 hours away from signing the contract with a hotel to host a writer's conference here in Sweden. Yeah. And then the world shut down. I'm like, I am so glad I did not sign that and give them my money. (laughs) But so now I had time on my hands again. So I worked with a business coach um, to, to grow my business in a way, that, okay, so so they had one idea of what the vision was, but it wasn't exactly my vision for it, but we grew the, uh, the coaching portion um, mm-hmm. so that I could like really focus on the kind of teaching that I love to do, which turns out pretty much one-to-one is my favorite, favorite, favorite. Um, and that's been great. But once again, I found myself hardly ever writing because, you know, I want to put my clients first. I do put my clients first, but then I have I'm like, I need to figure out a way to put my clients first and put myself first also. Like somehow we all need to fit on the same bench. <laughs> well, you know, since I'm retired, my daughter keeps saying, so mom, when are you going to retire? Because I keep working. But fortunately, I'm I'm in a position that I, I only have to work as much as I have to. I mean, I the, the income, I don't have a lot of retirement income. So the income does help but I don't have to replace my full income. There's a part of me, friends have asked me, do you wish that you you could have stopped working, you know, 15, 20 years ago and, and just written, because I'm happier now than I've been in probably ever when it comes to work. I love what I do. But then I would have had to make enough to live off of. And and to, to start from scratch as a writer, as a freelance writer, that's tough. Yeah. So 
you know, now I can pick and choose. I don't, you know, so clients that I don't want to work with, I don't have to work with them. And, and, um, you know, but the difference is much like what you're going through, the clients that I do have, I mean, all of a sudden they'll just email me and say, Hey, Lynn, can you take a look at this? And when I need it back by tomorrow. So, you know, sometimes my schedule isn't my own. Um, but for the most part, you know, I can balance better the novel writing with the, you know, with the freelance writing, because the freelance writing brings, you know, income in immediately. As you know, the novel writing, first of all, you have to finish the novel, you have to get yeah. it and, and then, and I'm all on Amazon, and they keep the money for, what is it, 60 days, you don't, you know, you can sell 100 books in a month, but you don't see that money for 60 days. So, you know, the, it's just a longer process to, to actually make money. Um, and, and I don't know what your thoughts on this are with Amazon, but you know, it's become so competitive on Amazon. When I first started 15 years ago with my first couple of books, if I did a free download, you know, I'd get five, six, 700 downloads easily. Yeah. Now, if I get 150, 200, I'm lucky. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's because that there's just so many authors on, on Amazon now. I mean, it's anybody, anybody can publish anything. So, you know, you, you, it is tougher to stand out. Um, you know, fortunately I have, I'm finishing the fifth book in my cozy mystery series, the old maids of Mercer Island. And then I have three books in my detective series and a standalone. And then I have a couple of short story books and, you know, what the experts tell you is to keep writing, keep putting up more books. Cause that's how you, you keep getting more, more readers. So, you know, you're sort of always chasing that carrot. Yeah. <laughs> close, but yeah, it's, um, it's tricky. And then the thing is, is that, you know, when I, I uh, was just interviewing an author who has only traditionally published for also around the last 13 or 14 years. Um, and she also, you know, there are, there are probably struggles in every business, but you know, the struggles of your own. So, mm -hmm. you know, like you and I are talking about these struggles, she has struggles with, um, you know, she needs to actually get the contract and needs to, you know, match the publishing house's vision. And then, you know, her waiting for payment, you know, is on a totally different schedule than yours and mine. But then I, I look at, you know, just about any one of my friends out there and something about their business. They're like, oh, this is the hard part of my business. And I keep trying to tell myself, you know what, this is just, um, this is the business you chose. And of all the businesses in the world, this is the one that you wanted. And so these are the struggles and I'll find creative ways to keep managing them. But you know that you you talked earlier about, I mean, you've diversified. And for those people who might be listening, something to, to think about, because I have too, when you're a writer, you don't only have to write novels. You know, right. um, if you're a competent writer, there's other, so I, I turn, I do freelance writing and I do novels. Well, I happen to write mystery novels. So a friend of mine is an event planner. And when we had lunch, I told her how, when I was in fundraising, I used to write fundraising mysteries that we would use for, for fundraising events. And so she, sure enough, she hired me to write a mystery for an event that she was going to hold in December and it got canceled, got postponed until next year. Um, so I put together a mystery and got paid for that. I had another, um, a Comic-Con group up here that, that hired me to write a comic book for them. So, you know, I, I think sometimes when it comes to writing, uh, writers need to look for opportunities. Yeah. And don't put them down, you know, just because I'd never read, written a comic book before. I didn't, that didn't stop me from saying, yeah, uh, let me take a stab at that. I'd love to do that. Right, right. Yeah, I, I joined, um, I used to sit on the organizing committee for the Seattle Film Summit here. I happened to know the organizer and just said, hey, do you want, you know, you're looking for volunteers. And I ended up on, because I'm a writer, I started writing for the, for the, the um, organization and ended up two years in a row doing um, presentations at their conference on one was on creating characters and the other was on killing people for fun and profit because because screenplay writers write um mysteries yeah they have to write characters they have you know they have to have no story structure so 
you know, I think people, a lot of times people, writers just need to look for some of those other opportunities that kind of expand their uh, bandwidth a little bit and they might find that they really like it. And, and volunteering, I'm always, cause I'm from the nonprofit world. I'm gonna always pitch volunteering. It's a great way to get to meet people and you never know when you're gonna meet somebody who can help you somehow. I've, I've through some of my volunteer work, I've met a couple of detectives that then became my, my go-to guys when I needed to do research on detective work. Nice. So you never know. Yeah. And, you know, everybody has a different personality and a different kind of level of um, how introverted, how extroverted they are. Like I'm an introvert from energy uh, from, you know, the actual definition from an energy perspective, I need to have my time alone. Um, but I do love people and I love talking to people. I love talking in front of people, like give me a, a group of people or an auditorium and like, I'm going to feel like I'm going to throw up, but like, I totally want to be there. <laughs> um, other people that is totally not their gig and please don't put me in front of any room of people. And then when you start looking at what you're good at and not good at what you, um, love or, you know, really would rather dive and do, then you can start finding like little, um, nooks and crannies of things where you're like, I didn't think about it this way. I can, uh, network at a cocktail party. I have to really be in the mood for it to work super well, but I can do it. But the, I think the most fun networking is when you volunteer with a group of people doing something that you would love to do anyway. Like I, I would um, volunteer because I went to church for a while in Los Angeles, about half of our church was in the entertainment industry, which made oh. me and my husband feel like so at home. It's like, these are our people. <laughs> uh, but you had to audition for the drama group at church because it was all made up of professionals <laughs> and the same with the, the music. Yeah, it was great. So, uh, but there was a lot of, uh, volunteer stuff that I could do, uh, because I, you know, couldn't qualify at that high a level for, uh, for some of the things that I thought I would have liked to do and would have easily been able to do in a smaller church in, you know, the rural Michigan where I grew up, but, uh, the thing is, is that now you're doing things that you're enjoying with people who are also enjoying them. And it's a whole different kind of networking. Like you're saying, now you're making real relationships with people, not passing out your business card at a cocktail party that you really wish you didn't have to go to. Well, you know, the gig, the gig economy and, and obviously the pandemic, um, you know, um, expanded this, but the gig economy has allowed writers a, a completely new platform uh, and when I joined Fiverr and what I, I said when I became kind of the one of the go-to people for speeches I, I had to do speeches in my nonprofit work as the executive director if we did a big event you know I had to get up and talk but I had never sold myself as a speech writer I mean that's not what I did but I did some research I, I read up on on there's a great uh, book on um, uh, the TED Talks. It's called Talk Like Ted. <laughs> I can't remember the name of the author, but he he breaks down um, the concept of speech writing, um, a la the TED Talks, and and that it's all about storytelling. Well, I just kind of soaked that up as a novel writer and as a as, and as a uh, ex theater person. It's sort of, you know I'm I'm just like immersed in the concept of storytelling. And so I approached speech writing that way. So then I started putting myself out there as a speech writer. And now, you know, people come to me to write, and I do most of the research for it, for just a broad range of topics that I've never written. I had to write on trucking, <laughs> trucking company once. And I thought, what? why am I doing this? Turned out and he loved it, gave me a five-star review and it's, you know, you know, who knows? Yeah. So again, as a writer, um, it, you know, most writers, I think, know more than they think they do um, when it comes to writing and could probably um, throw a net, you know, throw the net out there and, and pull in a lot of opportunities. And you just, I, I mean, Fiverr has allowed me to work for some of the greatest people. I, I wrote, um, did a couple of jobs for uh, a company in, it's a nonprofit in Alaska. They go out and they hunt for relics. And wow. then they, 
they turn the the relics over to museums and universities and stuff before they disintegrate. Um, I wrote for a woman who trains elephants in Thailand, and what she really does is she trains the trainers to train the elephants humanely. I mean, you know, wow. Stuff like Wrote, I wrote a speech for the for the descendant, um, you know, the, the uh, oh God, now I'm going to, my mind's going to go blank, the, um, the families, it's not the, oh God, anyway, they're, they're, they're very famous uh, from the Appalachian Mountains that, that they were longtime uh, enemies of each other. And, oh, right, um, uh, McCoy. Um, yes, the Hatfields and the McCoys, thank yeah. you. Yeah. He was a direct descendant of, it's a weird name, it's, it's, it's Dens Anvil Hatfield, something like that. He, he was the patriarch, and this guy was a direct descendant of his. You know, and I thought, how weird that I'm writing for this guy. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it, it's um, that's been a real journey for me that, that I've had, I mean, my novel writing it's wonderful because I meet some wonderful people. I mean, I could I have called up the King County coroner here in Seattle a couple of times to have her talk me through cadaver dogs and stuff because she's worked with those. And, you know, what happens to bones at the bottom of a well after 40 years? Because that was the opening to one of my books. That kind of thing is just fascinating. I, I interviewed a guy who he was actually he used to be part of a, one of the fire departments in New York and left just before 9-11, but it was some of his buddies that died. And so he went back and he was one of the people that helped uh, clear the site. And he now works in Olympia and he teaches um, rescue. Oh, and wow. this book, this was the second book in my Georgia Salvatore, uh, Salvatore mystery. It's called uh, Murder in the Past Tense. I love that title. And they find the, the bones of a, um, well, they don't know it's a young woman yet. But it's bones at the bottom of this old well. And I thought, well, getting to the bottom of a well that's been there for 100 years must be really dangerous. And I kind of came up with some ideas of how they could do it with a fire truck and what have you. And then when I, somebody said, hey, I've got a friend that's in search and rescue, you want to talk to him? You know, part of being a writer is you have to be willing to just pick up the phone and say, hey, I'd, or an email, and I'd love to talk to you. Every, they all want to talk to you. Yeah. I, I didn't let anybody turn me down. And he literally, I took him to lunch and he, he sat there drawing on a napkin how they would go about bringing these bones up and that they'd have to put fans down there because they're probably with carbon monoxide and all these noxious noxious fumes and stuff and I mean it was just so fascinating to to listen to him and I thought god I just met him this is just so cool yeah so I think part of what I love about what I'm doing is the people I meet like you I mean it's and you, you don't want to just sit and I don't want to just sit there and type all day long it's yeah. part of it is a journey for me as well I think yeah yeah and I think that um I don't know if this is true I actually now I'm like oh I should see if there's any studies on whether or not people who are creative and continue creating throughout their life like do we live longer are we healthier because yeah. um you know you hear things about people who will maybe be um a business person they're waiting until they're 65 so they can retire and then um they had this idea that retirement would really be enjoyable sitting in their recliner or going golfing. Um, and the people who sit in their recliner tend to die a lot sooner. So I don't know, in my mind, I'm thinking this is good for me. I'll probably live longer. <laughs> well, it keeps your brain active. I mean, that's the reality is I think people who almost in any form of creativity, whether it's art or music or writing or film or, you, you know, your, your brain is constantly you know, moving and figuring, because it's a lot of it, it's problem solving, isn't yeah. it? I mean, especially with not just the, not just writing, because the story craft itself is an art form. And, and I, and I've noticed how even when I'm writing a, say, a case statement for a nonprofit, I, I tend to build them more in a story format. But writing mysteries, you know, that's, that's a puzzle that, that I have to, I have to deconstruct it in a way that I was just 
um, talking to somebody the other day saying, you know, that when you're a mystery writer, your job is to hide the killer. I mean, that's, that's my first job, hide the killer. And, and then leave a trail of clues where the audience hopefully don't guess who the killer is until maybe two thirds of the way through the book. And then you reveal the, you know, the reveal is the, is the big thing when you, when you're ready to do that. Well, that's, that's all kind of building and deconstructing and then putting a, a puzzle back together again. And that takes brain power. So I, I look at it as at least, I don't know if I'll live longer, but hopefully I'll be mentally active and healthy, mentally healthy longer. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I could be totally wrong. <laughs> but, you know, but if my books start just not making any sense, then. I know I should. Maybe it's not working. I don't know. <laughs> now, um, so we've um, we've talked uh, kind of around this idea of retirement, and I know that you're retired from your job, but you're not retired from working. So, what? Tell us a little bit about um, if you think that there are any differences between uh, the writing that you were doing while you were working and now uh, writing. You're full time. It's not 100% novels. You know, you're doing different things. You know, so you're writing in retirement. Is there a difference? Has has anything changed? Um, a couple things. You know, one is when I was writing as an executive director, um, it was more sporadic, and and the writing, a lot of the writing was policies and procedures and you know stuff like that, which was which I was good at, but wasn't terribly fulfilling. Yeah. Um, and in the, and I think the biggest difference for me is that I had to do it. You know, um, there wasn't anybody else on staff for the most part who knew how to write. And, um, and also there, you know, I would oftentimes run whatever I'd written past board members and board members aren't necessarily writers. And so then I, you know, tend to get disappointed because they didn't see my vision or, or whatever. So now, that still happens to me with some of my clients, you know, so part of my job um, as a freelancer is to understand fully what the client wants. And I would say, you know, eight times out of 10, I'm really good at that. But, but a lot of it is asking the right questions to get the information that you need. And um, so that's, so that's different in that, in that I have more freedom uh, because a lot of the people that come to me, it, it, the speech writing has just kind of amazed me because the number of people that are out there trying to recreate careers into um, uh, like not just keynote speakers, they, they want to get on the speaking circuit. A lot of them want to be consultants or coaches. They want to be life coaches. That's very popular right now. And so then they come to me, this, which is so funny, to write the speech, you know, and um, and oftentimes they'll say, I want I want to write a speech on, you know, positive thinking or or you know something in the workplace, you know, how to how to how to build um, employee morale or something like that, and they just let me do it. Others will; these are the ones that are tougher for me to work with. They they know what they want to say and they'll give me some key only key points and then i start writing and then they come back and they say no you know i want i want to so then there's this back and forth where i'm then i'm and then i'm trying to figure out okay i'm, I'm trying this is somebody who when they hear it they're going to know what they want but they didn't know enough to tell me in the beginning right. so you know that's some of the difference between retired writing and the retire when I was writing as a full-time person. But again, if I run across a client that I have trouble with, I don't have to work with them again. Yeah. Yeah. So it allows me to, to focus on the things that, that I enjoy more. And, um, and I get, I think I get more, I think I get more a feeling of accomplishment out of it than I did when I was writing you know, as a staff member, you right. know, as an employee, um, it's, it's much, I think it's much more fulfilling for me. And the, and the novel writing certainly is because I have a fan base. I mean, people are emailing me saying, when's the next Old Maids of Mercer Island coming out? And what I just, I just 
posted the new um, a cover to that book on my Facebook feed the other day. And I got a lot of hooray, hooray, we can hardly wait. You know, well, that makes you feel good. That makes you feel really good when people are li- literally, so one woman emailed me and said, okay, I know, I know last time I don't, I've never met this woman. She just, she found me through my website and she emailed me months and months ago and said, are, are you still writing? Cause it's been so long since I put a book out. And um, I said, yeah, no, no, I'm, I'm working on the next Old Maids and, and I'm hope to have it up by the end of the year, which is now going to be January. So, so then she emailed me just recently and she said, well, okay, I know you're working on it, but I can't wait. So I'm going to go reread your last one. I'm going to read it again. <laughs> and then hopefully by the time I'm done, you'll, so that, I thought that was kind of sweet, but you know, so I- those kind of things make you feel good. So yeah. Those are my favorite kinds of fans. I'm like, could you just email me, um, like psychically connect with me every time I'm like, oh, what am I doing? And then, and then I'll be like, oh, she needs it. I got to keep going. <laughs> Do you, Kitty, I, I was just talking to my roommate about this tonight, that because I have a, an idea in my mind for another series that I'm, uh, I really want to write a horror book. I really, really want to, because I've written some horror short stories and and he said, God, you have so many ideas. That's the part of me that, that wishes that I could make enough money to just write my books full time. Do you, I, do you have constantly ideas in your head that are just churning, waiting to come out? Yes. And sometimes it's like, um, you know, four more ideas for this series and three more ideas for that series. And I'm like, thank goodness, this is good. The series are going to keep on going for a while. But then I have this other idea. I'm like, Oh my gosh. And I'm thinking to myself, no, this isn't right. Shiny. Like I am totally going to write this story. I started something in grad school that honestly I stopped because, um, my teachers were, uh, brilliant, but, um, not interested in, uh, commercial genre fiction. Oh, and so, uh, you know, I brought this, this idea for this kind of spiritual warfare battle thing that was going to happen in New York city and some kids that got kidnapped and, uh, an angel, uh, who was rescuing them and another angel who was masquerading as a human. And it, um, it was, uh, very exciting and intense for me. And I, I was so excited. And, um, and my advisor, she kind of, listen to me, give her this idea. I'm like, it's a little bit like Jim Butcher's Harry Dresden files, but it's also a little bit like the supernatural TV show. And, um, and she's like, yeah, okay. So, um, uh, my assignment for you is to read Anna Karenina. And I'm like, Tolstoy, I don't think that you understand. And I never finished that book because I just felt like, um, you know, somebody, uh, doused my thought. Yeah. 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 Um, but so yes, in answer to your question, I always have ideas. And when it comes to murder mysteries, like I have like three ideas for mysteries because, um, less so since I've lived in Sweden, but when I lived in Los Angeles, it seemed like I was always like memorizing license plates of very, um, uh, uh, what's the word, um, uh, suspicious vehicles. I'm like that white panel van the the lettering on it is crooked. And it doesn't look like it actually is a painter. And I've seen movies and these, yeah, who right. knows, you know, or, or that one over there, are they a kidnapper? Is there a kidnapped kid in that van? Yeah, I just, I don't know. So I have to tell you a story about when, so my old mates of Mercer Island books is about four older women who, and they're, and they're, these are humorous books and they're parent, all my book, my novels are paranormal, but the, the, the ghosts are all helpful and, and friendly and sometimes funny. <laughs> and, and in this series, Julia, who's Julia Applegate, who's, and she's, she's, my daughter thinks she's basically me, but she's, she's clumsy. So she's funny because she, she does a lot of Pratt falls. I don't necessarily do that, but <laughs> I decided it, this is me. I'm a panster, and for your, if any of your listeners don't know what a panster versus a plotter is, the panster is I write by the seat of my pants, so I don't plot my books out in advance. I get an idea, and I know the beginning and the end, and then I kind of start writing. And so I came up with this idea that I was going to take the girl, the the girls, on a road trip. And it was going to be called All All Roads Lead to Murder. I had the title. I knew that they were going to go on a road trip. And then I, and then it was kind of like, oh, crap. Now what? How do you, I, I mean, all of a sudden I was just stuck with 
how do you create a mystery on the road? Because in a mystery, you have it's usually in a confined space, right? You're you're on an island or in a in a certain geographical area, at least for cozy mysteries. And and you have to keep running into the murderers, you know, you don't know that the murderers or whatever. And all of a sudden these, I was gonna put these women on the road. And I and I figured out how to do it with an abduction uh -huh. that she, Julia, sees a, a young woman in the back of, a, of a, a motor home that looks like she's calling for help. And, you know, they knew from the news that there had been a, a, an abduction of a congressman's daughter in the Seattle area. And, and there, and then I thought, well, but how, they wouldn't be on the same road together. How am I going to, you know, you had a lot, like I say, a lot of what writing, when I, when I teach writing, a lot of what I talk about is it's all about decisions as an author, you, you, you have to make a series of decisions about how you're going to you're going to lay this story out and i had to think all right one of my major decisions was is they were going to chicago they had to go to wisconsin to drop this motorhome off and then they were going to chicago for this for this big um, convention and the people in the motorhome were also going to chicago well there happens to be a main highway that goes from seattle basically to illinois highway 90 lucky for me. So there was a reason for them to kind of keep passing each other or running into each other. And, and it turned out to be this hysterical, um, wacky book. Um, so, you know, I don't know, writing, I, and I think that's why some writers maybe give up. I, I know in the class I teach, uh, when I started teaching, I was teaching more the craft of writing. And I realized I needed to teach story craft because so many people, they get an idea about a book in their head. I've got this idea, but they have no idea how to create the story. Yeah. What, what the story structure is, what an inciting moment is, what a hook is, you know, they don't know any of that. And, and it's really interesting to even when people in the class, because I know I can kind of tell the ones that are going to actually finish a book and the ones that just won't. It's because it's, I don't think people realize how much goes into writing a novel and how complicated a process and how much work it is that there is in it to do it well. And um, so that's why I switched to to teach storycraft and I don't I can only through it's it's through continuing education at Green River College so it's five nights for five weeks uh, or one night a week for five weeks because they have to charge and my only criticism I ever get is the class is too short they uh -huh. the students want it longer because I have to cover so much material in five classes yeah you know um so, and I know that you know that from your master's degree, that that you you have all of that already inside you. But the the person on the street who wants to, you know, write a book, yeah, I mean, they're just at a loss. Yeah, and one of the things that I try to help um, newer, so I just I don't want to say like brand new because sometimes it's just a, a longer process but um, newer writers is that self-editing is not just about changing your passive verbs to action verbs. Like that doesn't really help if you haven't gotten the story onto the page. You need to be able to step back and look at the 30,000 foot view and see whether or not the person at the beginning changed in some way before the end. And Right. Well, so. and there's pacing. You have to you have to think about pacing. You have to think, uh, you know, about voice of the character. Uh, you know, as you say, the growth of the character. Um, you have to understand plot points and and certain things that have to happen during the story. And and I think a lot of people just when they then when they realize that, then they give up. You know, it's like it's kind of a fantasy to think oh, I've got this great idea for a book. But when they realize how much work it takes to 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 actually put it together, it's kind of like, yeah. Except for, <laughs> yeah. And you can probably also tell the the people who are who are probably going to continue. Also, um, th this is what I see is that um, they get that look on their face. So they're like, oh, this is way harder than I thought. And then they're like, 
okay, here I go. And you're like, yeah, that's yeah. what it takes. They get, over, they get over that barrier of, of it just being too overwhelming. Well, and I, I think, I think the service that you provide is, is probably really valuable because, especially for those people that get stuck and, and maybe aren't steeped in it. One of the reasons, to be honest with you, you know, another thing, you know, it's kind of goes with what I was saying earlier. The reason I started teaching was because I knew I had to remember things like pacing and story structure and, you know, all of this, and, you know, I had, I, you know, uh, understand the, the mechanics of the book and what to look for. And, uh, and so I thought, well, if I teach, I'm going to be, I'm just going to be keeping reminding myself of that every, so then when I go back and I look at my book, I'm thinking, Hey, wait a minute, Lynn, you know, this isn't working here. And so, you know, I, I, you know, I guess there's just all for me, it's just always, so there's always a way to, if, if you're serious about it, if it's something that you really want to do, that you find a way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess that's really true about most everything in life, but since it's a writer's podcast, you know, I just want to spend one minute encouraging people. There will be times when you get discouraged. That does not mean that today's the day that you give it all up. You just have to give yourself a little bit of time sometimes. And um, I have a tendency sometimes to go refill myself up with, um, I, I try to find great stories. And the reason why I pause there is because sometimes I, I have to go, I choose to go back and watch like my favorite, favorite, favorite movies, because I can do it a lot quicker than I can read a book. Um, there's a, there's a book on my shelf that I, I was thinking to myself this morning. I really need to read, reread the Institute again by Stephen King. I loved it so much that sometimes I would just close the book, even though I had extra time for reading, I would close the book. And I'm like, I want this book to last forever. So I'm not going to read it again until tomorrow. And I made it last for like two months because it was so good. <laughs> but now I'm like, I, I want to sit down right. and just, sorry. I think so. When people get stuck, they need to find that whatever that way is to refresh themselves. Yes. And sometimes to me, it's talking to other people. It's, it's, if I get stuck in the story, I'll call my daughter a lot of times or, or talk to friends and say, Hey, you know, and I'll kind of, you know, map out where, where I am. And I, even if the, even if the ideas they give me aren't what I want, it, it has a tendency to break apart my thinking. Do you know what I mean? And, yeah. and, and then a lot of times I get, oh, I go, oh yeah, no, I know. Now I know what I, what I want to do. And it's just, I don't know, it's because this is a writing podcast. I think there, there is, there's always a light at the end of the tunnel and there is such a tremendous amount of joy when you're done and, and you have, you have a really credible story um, that, you know, is going to resonate with people. I mean, that's just, and, you know, they say write for yourself first. And, and I know that because my cozy mystery series, um, cause cozy mysteries have some rules that you have to follow, like no foul language and no graphic violence or graphic sex. And, and my women do swear it's light swearing, but they swear and they talk about sex all the time. Nothing, nothing gra graphic. <laughs> And I get thank yous from my readers saying, thank you for writing about older women that aren't dead yet. And, and I, you, so I look at that, that, um, that series is, is kind of an expression of me, you know, and, and my ability to, to sort of put myself out there and, um, and have fun, even though it's murder. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I'm not killing people. Um, uh, that's why I, I I do a presentation called "Killing People for Fun and Profit" because because that's what I do. But um, and this and the next book is so exciting for me. I, I think it may be the best book I've written because I'm I we somehow I weaved in Jack the Ripper into these nice. women on Mercer Island. Um, and I think I came up with a really credible explanation of who Jack the Ripper was. Well, that really excites me. That's kind of like, wow, I did that. So, you know, there's there's so much joy in writing, even, even if nobody ever reads it. 
I mean, frankly, you know, that's the part of you that you have to write for yourself that yeah. it's, but on the other hand, you are, and where I started on the cozy mystery series, I, I do have to be careful with that because I do have an audience now and my writer, my critique group will say, well, why can't you just push the boundaries there? And I said, cause I'll, I'll lose readers. So I have, I have, even though my, my cozy mystery is, a, does push the envelope a little bit. I can't go too far. Yeah. You know, you, you, you have to, have, there are some parameters I can't, I can't cross, but, um, but I, but I have fun with it. I have so much <laughs> time. There's a talking parrot in who that quotes old movies and, and two dogs. Like I have my two miniature dachshunds here. There's dogs in every one of my books. Cause I love dogs. And so they, play main characters they often save the day <laughs> nice nice even though my dogs would never save the day my dogs would welcome somebody into the house they'd probably open the door for them right <laughs> I'd go up there they're heroes so <laughs> nice it's like um gracie and what's the other dog's name Ma- mango <laughs> my gracie daughter and mango. mango this is this is what you could be like just know you could like be this kind of dog <laughs> Well, it's funny because in, in the old maids, Gracie, my female is much more tenacious. And, and so she, she attacks a a couple of people and she, in this current book, she bites some, a guy right where it hurts because she jumps. She, and she is a really good jumper. (laughs) Mango, when he gets excited, he really does spin in circles on the floor and so in, in a couple of the books, I, when my, my protagonist gets attacked, he gets all excited and, and it just starts spinning like an egg beater at her feet. Like, like how, what is that doing? How is that helping? And she's like getting choked and he's at the floor going like this. So, <laughs> and that's real. That's like, to me, that's realistic. That's exactly what Mango would do. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Okay. I want to talk to you about writing all day long, but it's nighttime for you. And, um, and also there's probably somebody, I, I always, um, uh, joke that there's probably somebody on a treadmill going, please stop talking. Cause I told myself I was going to keep going until the podcast was over. Yeah. That's how I do with my, my own running. Um, but okay. Quick question though. I don't know if you can put it into, you know, just like kind of condense it into a thought, but for people who either are in retirement or have been thinking, you know, I'm going to be able to write so much more when I'm in retirement. Um, Do you have any kind of words of wisdom or encouragement? Because it's probably going to end up looking different than, than what it seems like it will in your imagination. I think for anybody, um, you know, it, it was easier for me because I was writing so much in my, my day job anyway. So if, if somebody is retiring and they did that, you know, transitioning uh, to doing some writing in retirement, you know, might be easier. If it's somebody who just kind of toyed with writing, and now that they're retired, they would like to start writing, then I would recommend taking webinars, listening to podcasts like yours. Um, There's just so many good books out there on writing, whether you want to be a screenplay writer or novelist or freelance writing. And then also to join, I belong to a number of writing organizations, Pacific Northwest Writers Association here. There's freelance writing associations I belong to. There's novel writing associations that I belong to. And um, so I'm always looking for webinars or, you know, connections with people. And and then lastly, if they want to to write novels um, as a well, I suppose you could, you could do it for freelance writing too, but that's to find a critique group. Um, you know, my critique group, I have to admit, keeps, I've been with them for, I think, close to 10 years now, and they keep me going, you know, because it's, it, we, we talk about a lot of stuff besides just writing, but they give me great feedback and none of us write the same stuff. You know, I'm the only really bona fide mystery, paranormal mystery writer. And, um, and so it's also a social connection, but they, but they're, they give you um, a lot of support too. So I think for somebody who's um, coming at this cold, um, I'd start taking classes, you know, like the kind of class that I teach through the college. Um, and, you know, you said you're going to have a conference coming up next year. Most big cities has, have conferences, you know, again, maybe not in person yet. Um, 
but but you can look online for those kinds of things and and find connections so that even even on Fiverr now, if you want to be a freelance writer, they have so all sorts of classes. And I don't. Are you familiar with Udemy? Yep. Udemy classes, because um, Udemy, there's a tons of online classes. I took uh, years ago. I wanted to be better at editing, and I took an online editing class, which taught me a lot. Yeah. So part of it is is understanding what what it is you want to do. You know, if you're going to be a freelance writer. Uh, even though I had written a lot in my jo- day job, I did a lot of studying on persuasive writing as soon as I retired before I launched my company. <clears throat> and um, so it's it's putting those tools together to say, okay, this is where I want, even if later you kind of spread out, that's fine, but get going in one direction and, and get the tools you need. And, and so you feel confident um, and, and meet people. I think a lot of it is getting connected to other people that are doing what you want to do. Yeah. So that would be my, my big advice. Brilliant. Awesome. Lynn, this has been super interesting for me. And, um, you know, I feel bad for, for everybody else, but we're going to keep on talking after the (laughs) podcast is over, (laughs) but tell us where can people find you, your books, your classes? No, I'm on, for my books, I'm on amazon.com, just Lynn Bohart. All you have to do is, if you, if you Google me on the internet, I'm, I'm kind of all over the place anyway, because of my jobs, I was always online and, and my books and now my freelance company. So just Google my name and, or, um, so for my books, my website for my books is www.lynnbohart-author.com. My company is Little Dog Communications, L-I-L. We were joking that it's not Little Dog Communications, it's Little Dog, um, dot com. Uh, and I'm on LinkedIn, on Facebook. And so I'm actually pretty easy to find. Awesome. And for people who are just listening. It sounds kind of uh, arrogant. I don't mean to sound arrogant, but I've Googled myself and I'm like, oh oh my God, I'm all over. Because there's all these articles being written about me when I took new jobs or did stuff with my foundation and now with my books and stuff and book signings and things like that. So yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. It's great. I mean, that's what we're supposed to. We're supposed to be able to like get the the whole first page covered on Google. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. and for people who are only listening, not listen, uh, not watching on YouTube, can you just spell your first and last name for us? Yes. Yeah, so the first name is L Y N N Lynn, no E, and Bohart B O H A R T. Awesome. Perfect. Thank you so much for giving us your time and so many different kinds of pieces of advice over so many areas. This has been great. Yes, this was kind of a stream of consciousness discussion, but that's okay. It was super great. I had a lot of fun and I'm sure people are like, that was cool. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Kitty. I appreciate it.